Hey, welcome back to the Cash PT Lunch Hour podcast. This is your host, Aaron LeBauer. And today, my special guest is Dave O'Sullivan, all the way from England. And uh, Dave has a successful physio business. He's also uh, trains other physios in um, treatment techniques and especially in telehealth as well. And so today, I brought on Dave because, well, we've known each other for a while and it's just been a long time coming. And he reached out to me and said, Hey, Aaron. You know, here's some information. Loved to, if this would help you. And I said, "Hey, let's get on a podcast." So Dave and I are on a podcast. And so Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Yeah, absolutely. So um, number one, it's pretty awesome to be able to get people on here from England and Australia and Canada, even when I'm living in North Carolina. So you know, like thanks to Zoom, we can do that. <laughs> That's you it, know. technology, yeah, it's, it's going to save us a lot in the, the next few weeks. I know, it is. So, um, Dave, I just want to start uh, back a little bit. Um, how did you get into physio? Can you tell me a little bit about, like, how did you get started on the path of um, being a physio? And you work for, like, I think the national rugby team. You know, can you just give us your brief overview? Of yeah, so um, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm Irish um, by, by birth, and when I was... Um, kind of 18 and said, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, seeing see the physios on, on the sports uh, TV and it's like, oh, that, that looks pretty good and um, went, spent two years trying to get into physio in Ireland and then came over to England um, in 2005 and um, studied physio in Huddersfield. Then um, my wife, met my wife halfway through, um, with two kids now, so I'm kind of in, in England whether I, whether I like it or not, but um, kind of very fortunate to go straight into professional sport, I suppose, in, in one regard. So I went straight in uh, from university to pro sports. I've worked in rugby league and, and rugby union, which are kind of two variations of the codes um, for about 10 to nearly 12 years now, actually. Um, and been fortunate to work with both national teams and, and do uh, two World Cups, actually, in, in Australia with the rugby league team and Japan with uh, with the rugby union team last, uh, last year. So... Um, yeah, very fortunate to you know get to travel the world doing doing something that I that I love doing, and, and as you mentioned, I also have a private practice in in Huddersfield, which is kind of in between Manchester and and Leeds in the UK. Okay, awesome. And so, just for perspective, even from my own, like number one sport in the UK is uh, probably football, right? Yeah. Is is rugby second, or is that cricket? Uh, good question. I would probably say. They'd be similar, yeah. Rugby or cricket, yeah. yeah. Good question. Is there anything else like in the top three, like that you guys? Um, rugby, cricket, netball is quite big with with uh, with, with females. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd say they're they're the three big ones: cricket, cricket, rugby, football. Okay, I just want to give because you know, majority of people who listen are Americans, and they we play. We're we're our, our American football, base uh, baseball, basketball, and. Uh, Soccer is like this other thing that you <laughs> kind of do. Around here sometimes. <laughs> that was my sport in in high school was uh, was soccer. So I played or football as you guys call it. But I wouldn't go. My grandfather played football in leather helmets. American football. I did soccer um, in high school. So I just for a little perspective. So rugby's like big time, right? So what's the number? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. be pretty big. Yeah. So what's the number one injury? What's the number one problem that people have? you know, when you're playing rugby, what are you doing? Um, yeah, I suppose from, from a physio point of view, it's a dream in terms of your exposure to injuries. Um, sometimes not in a good way, but uh, when they're tricky, but we, we got to see everything is, is probably the honest answer. So, you know, from slap tears, ladder J's in the shoulder to syndesmosis in the ankle, MCLs, ACLs, uh, disc issues in the neck, back, Tom's wrists, mm -hmm. you know, literally we, we see it all, um, you know, which is, is good, as I said, from a physio point of view, challenging, um, obviously sometimes with, with certain injuries, but uh, yeah, we, we get we get a lot of variety. Yeah, more like impact injuries than overuse injuries? A um, bit, bit of both, to be honest. Um, you know, we still get our hamstrings and our groins and, you know, um, quad tears, calf tears, Achilles issues. So um, it, a bit of both, to be honest. It, it, you, you kind of go through cycles where you won't see one MCL and then you look three and, you know, you, you, you kind of swings around about three. Really. Right, right. So how did you get from rugby league physio to uh, owning a business? Was it like a natural thing? Were you like, oh, this is like the next thing or... 
was did you always think you were going to do that or was there something that kind of yeah i kind of I, I always had the vision of like be having like this top sports injury clinic um you know so when i was working with Leeds Ryan, you know, straight out of uni um i set up um my clinic above a running shop you know just paid rent as as i seen people built up the word of my reputation started treat right. runners in huddersfield um which is a nice one to, to start with the word of mouth spreads um and and just built it from there really um and obviously, you know, as you know yourself, you kind of you have this dream of, of having a sports injury clinic, and, and the next thing you realise is that it's the fifty year old plus with, with back pain that's that's paying the mortgage. So you, right. you kind of you, you quickly pivot. But um, yeah, so I mean, we get we get the best of both worlds in the clinic, but the vast majority are are, are non sporting injuries, even though we're, we're called pro sport physio. Right, right, yeah. I, and people always say, "Oh, I want to get in and work with athletes." I'm like, "Yeah, athletes are a pain in the butt." <laughs> And they don't yeah. pay the bills. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, so you've been doing that for how how long have you had that clinic? Uh, ten years now. Okay. Um, just just coming up to ten years. So we're in we're in this uh, clinic uh, for about three years. So this is um, this is uh, obviously um, a little bit bigger now. We've got um, five treatment rooms, a yoga studio, kind of a personal mm -hmm. training um, studio. So kind of built it up. Um, through the years, took on staff. You know, uh, lucky to have some really good staff with me, and um, and we've we've been able to build it up predominantly through word of mouth, and then obviously doing do marketing and, and stuff to, to complement as you get bigger. Which that that's all well and good. Obviously, it's a little bit scary times at, at the moment with the bigger wage bill. But um, yeah, I suppose you, you take the good with the bad. Yeah. So, what was the um, most challenging thing about uh, building that clinic for you? Um, I I think to be honest, it was, it was making it profitable. Um, and I think it's really, you know, I kind of, I got mesmerized with, with revenue and um, it was only kind of when I started to focus on profit that I kind of started to see, okay, actually um, I need to run this business a little bit differently. And I think a lot of that as well was my own discipline. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it was, was kind of spending um, on, on kind of what you're, what you're spending on uh, silly things really when, when you have a bit of cash flowing. Um, I suppose I'm lucky now in this environment that we do have a little bit of cash, not a lot, but we have a bit of cash in the bank, you know, certainly for the next month or two to, to kind of keep us, keep us going, you know, luckily. Yeah. When you started looking at profit instead of revenue, what, what did you change? Besides just spend, like, was there something um, that, like number one thing that made a bigger difference or that you changed? It? Yeah, I, I think, I think it was expenses, to be honest. I think I was, I probably subscriptions, you know, when, when you look at your, your, your outgoings and, and you look at all the subscriptions you have and, and actually how much value they, they are and, and what you need to run a business. And, and even now, to be honest, I think, you know, in a way I'm trying to look at this as a positive and go, right, what do I need to run this business essentially? And, mm -hmm. and there's, you know, there's, there's bits there that I, that I can cut and, and, you know, even probably staff members as, as bad as it sounds, you kind of look at them and go, actually, you know, to run this business essentially now on its bare bones to keep it alive, what do I actually need? And, and you can kind of see, you know, am I getting enough value out of, out of certain people? Um, so it's, it's a big, big opener, but I would say, yeah, it's, a, it's the spending as opposed to the, you know, the, it's all seems to be about, you know, offense, get more patience, get more patience, whereas sometimes you kind of, you have patience, it's the li lifetime value of them or how many sessions they're having to, mm -hmm. to improve that side of it is, um, I think made a big difference as well, actually. Um, and kind of focusing on the people that we did have rather than, you know, always spending to get more. Yeah. What's the one thing that you guys are doing with your patients to um, increase their lifetime value, which is, you know, get them to buy more or, do you know, Right. Yeah. So, um, so that's kind of my, I suppose, USP, if you will, is, um, is using the pro sport approach in private practice. Mm -hmm. So, um, so in professional sport, you know, a, a guy gets an injury, he, he may or may not have a scan, but the first thing a coach wants to know is, right, how long is he out for? And then the, the first thing the athlete wants to know is, right, what's my plan? What do I need to do to, to hit these milestones and get back? So, so a lot, of, I don't know what, it, what it's like in the US, but a lot of therapists in the UK, it's like a patient comes in and it's like, okay, we just go session to session. And then, you know, the pain eases a little bit and then the, the patient, away they go. Whereas what we try to do with, with the patient is we'll bring them in, we'll assess them, we'll sit them down, we'll give them an honest opinion of, of how long we think it's going to take. And we'll, we'll actually map out a, a kind of a ghost plan. You know, this is what's going to happen this week, this week, this week. We hit these milestones, then you get back running. So I try to give patients a lot of clarity in the first session. Um, and then I find just like therapists, when, when 
they have clarity, they can kind of understand why they're doing what they're doing, then the adherence improves, the drop-offs decrease, and um, and obviously they get the result, which is is going to be massive for us for word of mouth and, and referring people to us. So kind of um, you know, and, and obviously they come back to us again then because they're they're happy they got the result. Yeah. So like that first visit, you're not really sounds like you're not concerned about fixing the problem, but getting buy-in so the patients know what to expect and setting expectations, yeah. right? It, it, exactly it, it's all about setting expectations in in the first session and to be honest I, I was a bit skeptical of that and i bet some of your listeners like oh you know that my patients expect hands-on and, and they expect mm-hmm. this this and this in the first session and, and and i was a little bit skeptical when we made the decision to go like this and, and what we found was a lot of our patients now they're even happier because what they have is they've got a clear plan in place of what they need to do to get right and um, I think we as therapists underestimate that a lot um, in terms of the, you know, it, I can use the analogy if you're, well, if I'm in London and I'm trying to get to Huddersfield and I have no idea how to get out of London, but I'm trying to get to Huddersfield, it's, it's pretty daunting. Whereas if you, you plug the GPS in and you, you have that map to follow straight away, you relax a bit, don't you, in the car yeah. and, and you just follow the follow the map and I, I think that's what happens a lot of patients is they, they go away in the first session almost going oh god right this is what's up this is what I need to do there, there's finally light at, at the end of the tunnel as opposed to kind of just you know trying to give them a quick fix and you know it, they feel okay leaving and then the pain comes back and and you kind of go on this on this roller coaster so yeah we that that's spot on what you just said we work really hard on setting expectations in, in the first session yeah. When you guys started doing that, what changed in your clinic? Like, was it, you know, t- was it on the numbers side uh, for numbers of patients, visits, revenue, profit, something else? Yeah, everything, to be honest, um, because, you know, if, if you get that expectation, then obviously if you sell packages or you sell pre, you know, prepaid mm-hmm. treatment plans, then the person's a lot more confident that they know, you know, um, that, or they, they believe in you as a therapist that, that you're going to um, help them. So they're, they're much more likely to sign up to the packages, um, which means your lifetime value or your, incre- your number of sessions per patient will increase usually, um, which will decrease drop-offs, cancellations, all, all the, the silly stuff. So I wouldn't say we're 100% on, you know, patients on the packages, but um, we're, we work very, very hard on trying to get people, get the money out of the way in the first session. And then it's just, right, let's just focus on, on getting you better then, you know? Yeah. Well, the number one question I get from people, from other therapists, when I'm teaching them how to sell, you know, packages and programs is, well, what happens if they get better before, you know, the eight visits that I recommended, you know? Well, yeah, you yeah, that? yeah. So, so what we do with that is we we'll do a little drawing, um, and and I call it effective explanation, basically. So again, the definition of that, you know, in layman's terms, would be we use stuff. Um, we come down to the patient's level rather than trying to drag them up to us with, with pain science explanations and, and stuff like that. So, one of the one of the drawings that I'll do is, you know, we, we'll kind of have twenty five percent through the calf, the hamstring, the quad, the glutes. We want everything to do its job. Whereas, the middle drawing might have something like, you know, fifteen, fifteen, uh, maybe the quads doing doing a, a little bit more. That's doing maybe forty, and then the, the glutes doing doing thirty. So, what I'll do is I'll show the patient that. Now, I'm making it sound a lot more complicated. The visual system obviously takes takes care of this, but I'll just say, okay, so after three or four sessions, this is where we're going to be at. But can you still see there's a problem? And then they'll obviously be able to see there's still an overloading somewhere. So just because the pain's gone doesn't necessarily mean your your balance, so to speak. So I make them answer that question, and um, and then they can kind of process that information in the first session so then they kind of understand okay just because the pain's gone we still have a little bit more work to do and, and that's kind of the bit you know the resilience bit and you know I, i've got a little bit of a bugbear with therapists i think we're, we're very good to talk about resilience and on twitter and, and all this about you know we need to build resilience for patients but actually therapists are afraid to take that extra session or two when the pain's gone to build resilience it's like oh no they can't afford it or, or this or that and it's actually well if it was a pro athlete just because the pain's gone does not mean he's going back training tomorrow i need to run him i need to make sure he's right before he he goes back training mm-hmm. um so yeah so that that's that can be scary for therapists at the start but once you kind of get used to it, it um i think it helps a lot yeah that make, that makes a lot of sense it's part of that expectation one of the things that we tell people is basically you know right when you feel like you don't need us is when phase three begins when our get stronger better faster phase begins 
right? Definitely, it's like they yeah. think they don't need us and that's great. That's a, and I always tell them, it's like, you're gonna get to this point where you think you don't need me anymore and that's when next phase starts and they go, oh yeah, Dr. LeBauer said, you know, it's that expectation, but yeah, people can feel pain free and still move like crap, you know, and then they'll be back yeah. in six months or three months or something, right? Yeah, and another one that we use that helps as well, actually, is, is we just do a graph. So, mm -hmm. you know, just a, a linear graph and go, right, this is where you're at now. This is running 10K. You know, this is the load yeah. tolerance that your, your tissues need to, to take. I'm a big fan of drawing stick main numbers, yeah. keeping it real simple so people can understand in their terms. You know, everyone knows stick main, everyone knows numbers. Yeah. And, um, and just go, look, this is where we're at. Just because, you know, you're pain free doing, doing this movement in the gym doesn't mean you're, you know, you're, you can, you've earned the right to get to that yet. Right. Um, and and they, they kind of tend, to, most of them, I'm not going to say everyone does, because you'll always have an outlier, but the vast majority, it works quite well. Oh, that's great. So Dave, you also train other physios in your treatment, the treatment techniques and training. And um, can you tell me a little bit more about, like you started that, uh, what, a few years ago in 2015? Yeah, right? uh, nearly, yeah, to 2015. I was, so, um, so I, was, I was still working in professional sport and I said, right, you know, um, I, I had a lot of therapists emailing me, you know, saying, oh, can I shadow you? Can I do this? Can I do that? So I was like, well, um, my second daughter was born at the time. So I was like, well, I want to get out of pro sport full time. You know, mm -hmm. let, let's try this for a year until, you know, to certainly bridge the gap until I can get the, the clinic full time where I'm, I'm in a full time. So started that. Um, honestly, only thought I'd be in it for a couple of years. And it's um, it's taken off now where we've, we've got over 350 therapists um, all over the world have gone through the mentorship, which is 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 really good and um you know i started kind of teaching you know and it's a bit like patience as well i started teaching you know hands-on techniques and rehab you know the stuff i use but what i quickly realized is is therapists need structure just like patients need structure and um i think the usp for for our mentorship you now is it's the step-by-step -step system and the structure that, that that i teach as opposed to the, the techniques, you know, I, I use um, various bits from, from, you know, a lot of American therapists, English therapists, you know, the kind of the best bits of everything. I've just packaged it into a step-by-step -step structure now. And, and I think that's the, the, the value that therapists get um, first and foremost, as opposed to, you know, oh, you're just going to learn a few techniques. It's right. How can I take a patient safely from the bed all the way through to the, the high level rehab? Right. You know, I think that's one thing that I was missing when I graduated from uh, PT school was, you know, we had all these ideas, but I didn't know, like, ha have a better idea about how to treat people or how to like, run them through some kind of system. Is that and but then once I kind of figured that out, I was like, Oh, here's the system. Here's my before and after and I can pretty much do this with most people. Is that something that you're giving? Is that what you're given? as like a basic outline. Yeah, so again, for, for us, it kind of goes back to that great exposure, um, kind of low tolerance graph. And, and for me, in, in a session, in any one session, it's just trying to get them to the next level of low tolerance. And I find that's very empowering for a therapist because it, it kind of takes away that urge to, to try to do everything in one session right. or you, you kind of go like this. It gives you, you know, tunnel vision, but in a good way of, right, I'm just focusing on this today to get you to here, to allow you to get to here so that you can run. So again, you know, I'd never run an athlete without, you know, making sure they can do their hopping progressions and, and not react negatively to that. Yeah. So, you know, we, we just follow that, that, you know, it's, I'd like to think it's very common sense step-by-step -step program really of, of um, you know, just the, the next step is, is the next common, common uh, sense logical progression. You know, what's the key piece of your evaluation that you use to either get buy-in or get people to understand that Dave knows exactly where my problem is? Because, I mean, would you agree that's an important piece? But 100%. So what's that, yeah, what's that like, technique or question that you have that helps you do that? Yeah, so we, we'll, we'll work very hard with subjective assessment. So I look at um, their previous injuries and then we'll do just a generic assessment. You know, we, we'll take bits like toe touch, backward bend, side flexion, you know, three planes of motion, like Gary Gray, SFMA, all kind of mixed in into one. And then I'll use a little bit of like um, submaximal uh, muscle loading and, and stuff like that. And um, what I try to do though in the explanation is we'll make it very specific to their story. So I'll say, okay, you know, when I'm explaining to them what I think the problem is, so obviously here's your, your pain. This is what I think is causing the problem, which is very often above, below, somewhere else in the body. But I'll, I'll offer proof. 
and I, I think that's very very important is we we offer proof from what we've seen in the assessment so if mm-hmm. there's something not quite right in the assessment I'll make the patient aware of that so I go you know can you feel the difference left and right here and then they'll say yeah or no and I'll say right I'm going to come back to that later just remember that and then I'll also when we're explaining I'll say to them okay so remember in the, in the examination when I said you know I asked you to do this and that felt a bit different well, I think that's contributing to put more pressure on your lower back because of that old ankle injury that you had in 2007 or 2008. That's why I think you're, you're moving like that. And, and very often you get that, oh, that makes sense. Um, you know, they, they kind of say that to you and you get that kind of, um, you know, that agreement, with, mm-hmm. which I think is very powerful. Um, so we, we try to, to make it as specific and put it into their context of their life rather than just going, you know, you've got weak glutes, you, you've got this, you've got that. It's like, right, well, why do you have a weak glute? Like, what's in your injury history that's causing that glute maybe to not do its job? And, and I think when they can make sense of, of it themselves there, then it's almost, as I said, it goes back to that relief of, ah, so that's why, you know, when I do this, I, I can't feel, feel this working no matter how many glute band exercises I, I do or mm-hmm. whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's awesome. And then, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, when you started, when you started your kind of like uh, this mentorship and training system, it's is it online? Is it? Do you guys do in person workshops, weekend trainings? How is that working? Yeah. So we we do. Um, it's it's a twelve week course um, online, and then you get lifetime access to that. And then um, we do kind of weekend courses as well. So. Um, at the moment, they're in UK and Ireland. I was supposed to go to Australia because we've got a few therapists in Australia now. So I was supposed to go there in May uh, for my first ever one, which is is now put on the backbone. And then I was hoping to get over to, I've got about five therapists in America doing it mm-hmm. at the moment. So I was hoping to get, get over to America uh, the back end of the year, whether or not that'll uh, that'll come to fruition, now is is another story. But right. um, so yeah, so we, we do do kind of two day refresher courses as part of it as well, and that's where we just kind of come together for a weekend and, and just tune up the hands on and the assessments. And, and to be honest, the first thing I do in in the, those sessions is the effective explanation. I work hard on on really getting the patient's clarity and, and the therapist communicating that treatment plan to the patient. Because, you know, I just can't can't emphasize enough how important that is. Yeah, and um, and that's something in my own clinic that that we work really hard with with our own staff as well. Awesome. Well, um, what was the big difference? Because you've got two businesses that there's two separate entities. You got your clinic and you've got your online or your mentorship and training program. In starting these two businesses, what was the what was the biggest difference between the two and making sure like they were successful? Because there's it's different having like a clinic where you're doing a lot of more in person treatment versus a um. A, a training program where you're doing either one on many or you know online training like what was the big like difference in getting them started um yeah good question i think i think i needed a lot more online marketing knowledge and and like click funnels and and you know all of these kind of stuff with the, with the online and mm-hmm. you know i cringe sometimes when i see some of my old website pages and stuff like that but it's like well you know it got us to kind of where we are today but I think I think that side of it was, um, you know, I I kind of had a small reputation, you know, among my peers and stuff like that. But kind of putting yourself out there in front of a lot of people that don't know you, that's scary. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm 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 getting a lot better being on front of a camera now. I'm, I'm sure you noticed yourself, but I used to hate going on camera. You know, talking. You do ten cuts of 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 a two minute clip, whereas now I just get in, I just do it. I couldn't even care what what it sounded like. It's just like yeah, I just get it out there. Right. Um, so so that, that 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 was a lot of uh, learning with the online stuff. Whereas the clinic side of it, it was always you know I, I kind of enjoyed you know um, having that one to one rapport with the patient, and mm-hmm. um, I suppose your personality comes out a lot more in in that side of it. So I think that's a big contributor as well to you know word about referrals and. And, and stuff like that um, initially. Yeah, was there was there a stumbling block you hit in one and not in the other in building or scaling it up? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I mean, it, it's so funny because both businesses, I think I think um, one of the problems I had was I, I was almost trying to drag staff between the two. Uh-huh. It was only when I went right, I made mean, because I like I had everyone initially on payroll for the clinic. So when I was trying to build the, the academy up, um, I was kind of like everyone was on payroll on the clinic and then the clinic was suffering and, and it was just a mess. Whereas when I went, right, 
the, the academy is the pro sport academy is busy enough now to support itself mm-hmm. um you know your payroll's coming out of that clinic staff are there that's when i was able to start getting profitable with both businesses and, and managing them both and looking at the expenses and and, and the times so yeah. i think that and you know, even to kind of go back to your question, the clinic side at the moment, the sales is is a problem. We're getting loads of leads, mm-hmm. but the sales kind of process needs needs a lot of work. Um, whereas the academy, we've got a very good salesperson, but the leads aren't as 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 much as as maybe we want. So it's kind of you got a lead problem here and a sales problem here, um, and and you're, you're trying to you know you're you're trying to um, kind of figure that out and. You know, I'll be honest, I don't give as much time to the clinic now as, as I probably should do. I think now it, it's only times like now where I go, shit, I, I need to spend some time and, and, and invest in it now. And, you know, and, and I'm trying to stay positive and I already had a meltdown at the weekend with stress and stuff. But I think, um, you know, I'm seeing this as an opportunity, a six week plus opportunity to, to get all my staff trained, to get all my marketing done for the clinic and, and just, you know, have it ready to go when, when we, get, we get running again. Yeah. So just for everyone listening, as we're recording it, it's March 30th (laughs) and, you know, like, so just for perspective with what's going on with the coronavirus and, um, and I think you said you guys are about a week ahead of us, but just to kind of piggyback on what you're saying, I think I spent more time in the clinic last week working on my clinic than I have in six months, you know, it's just like, you know, it's like, all right, time to pivot shift. Make sure the yeah. clinic is, you know, like we're retaining, we're retaining uh, patients and revenue, and then we've got Plan B in place as soon as everyone has uh, time. And um, yeah, it's been kind of uh, interesting, like, you know, like bouncing yeah. between the two, you know. Yeah, I, I said I said the exact same thing on on my public Facebook page on Friday. I said I got more work done this week in the clinic than I have done in the last six months. Yeah. it's uh it's it's frightening and it kind of it really reinforces as well that that's your baby and you know everything else is is kind of built on on that really um right. you know and i always think that's the thing i can you know if this ever doesn't work out with the online i'll always go back to the clinic and, and treat you know mm-hmm. 40 hours a week again which isn't necessarily what i want to do but it's um it's it's there if you know god forbid i, I needed to do it Right. So what, um, and so that brings me to like the, one of the main uh, reasons I wanted to hop on here is what are you guys doing right now in your clinic it, to kind of transition patients through like to transition through this time and still generate revenue and profit like we talked about. And this specifically, like, how are you utilizing telehealth in your, in your business and your clinic? And Yeah. So, so it, it's interesting because we, we're at a stage now where, and again, it's, it's, it's really good for cash flow is that a lot of our, ter- our sessions are packages. So we've had a lot of prepaid um, people. Mm-hmm. Now, interestingly, again, I, I'm sure you, you, um, you know, I, I presume you guys are, are doing it as well. Um, and, or, you know, you're, you may be fans of it, but um, those people who are prepaid, very little resistance in coming online um, to, you know, next sessions online, that's fine. Because again, the money's out of the way, that, that's great. So we're, we're kind of delivering all those for the past week. Um, but it's it's the, the newer patients that are a little bit harder. And again, it's, you know, it's the no like, and trust. And it's, it's trying to get people over the skepticism of telehealth and the fact that you can get results Um with with just your hands and i think there's two there's two kind of things there there's the the therapist having confidence getting results without their hands and then the patient being skeptical that you can get results without without your hands so you're trying to communicate confidently and Mm -hmm. and kind of overcome those those objections so we're doing a lot of that on our blogs at the moment so we're, we're putting out a lot of blog content you know showing people how how online telehealth works we're, we're showing them case studies of people like screenshots of people doing it just just to take the fear the, uh, the unknown out of it really um, um we're working hard with that and um i think as well then the other bit that you know i was mentioning to you is we're, we're trying to reduce the expenses at the moment so um you know we're trying to get just one therapist maybe to 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 work a 40 hour week rather than having two or three on payroll until we can kind of get that lag of of new patients coming in again um so again it's you're you're kind of um you're managing the the cash flow forecast which is um you know i've always been told about cash flow forecast i'll be honest i never really done it properly but uh last weekend i I done one properly for the first time and it's uh it's it's a powerful thing when when there's a little bit of pressure to to do one 
Yeah, sometimes it does it does take pressure to put you at your best some days and I would I don't like the pressure, like the negative pressure, but some days yeah. that's what's going to really like push us to do be better business owners and, you know, survive out of this when people are just like sitting back and yeah. doing it. hands up, I'm giving up, right? Yeah, and I think I think it's hard like I, I did have a moment or two like where I could feel the stress coming because I was like yeah. God, I'm going to have some difficult conversations with my staff at, on Monday and, and stuff whereas 19 you know it's probably the 80 20 rule 80% of the time I'm positive and I just can't wait for this to pass now so that you can see actually right I could I need to run my business like this I need to have a cash flow and you know I need to um, do all these things and I need to run it you know, like, like there is a crisis um, every week and, you know, it, it's it's quite exciting in a way if we can get through this, how profitable your business will be when you can kind of see actually what, what you do need and versus what, you know, what you've kind of been telling yourself you needed. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, I mean, are people coming to you, like into your clinic as one of the, one of the reasons they're coming, is it because you guys do hands-on work or is that part of your reputation? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it definitely would have been before. So, like, we we've got like five, five thousand, five and a half thousand on our email list now, mm -hmm. like past patients. So, um, a lot of our early patients would have been very, very hands on. And then, obviously, as as the years gone on, we kind of adopted this approach. So we're we're kind of less hands on, hands on ish at the start, first few sessions. And then, as we we progress, it, it kind of you know the rehab takes over a lot more in sessions. Um, so yeah, it's just trying to get that skepticism um, out, and you know, one thing I would say, well, um, you know, for you guys who are, who are probably weak behind us, is just keep reaching out to your past patients. We we picked up, um, we put an email out saying, uh, "How are you feeling?" Name in the email browser, and just a quick five sentence email, just checking in. You know, we got nine responses from um, from past patients saying, "I, I think it was how are you feeling." Uh, the physios are doing blogs this week. Is there anything you're struggling with? Um, you know, I want this content to be as specific as possible. Uh, hit reply, let me know. And um, mm -hmm. you know, we got nine replies, and a f quite a few of them have, are coming in for like online uh, free taster discovery sessions this week. So they're just going to come in. Let them see what it, what it's like, you know. Give them a bit of advice, and then hopefully some of them will come on to, to kind of paid sessions on on the back of that. So stuff stuff like that, it, you know, simple little things like that, um, you can you can definitely be doing as well. Yeah, wow, that's powerful. So, Dave, what are you uh, doing in your clinic, and what are you teaching the physios in your mentorship about how to get like the same or similar, even better results using telehealth, where you can't actually touch people? Yeah, um, good question. So, so my kind of approach is um, rather than kind of isolating a muscle, it's right. Well, if an area of the body is sore, like let's say for instance the knee joint, um, every time you stand up, well, let's get your calf, your hamstring, and your your glute doing a bit more work, so your knee doesn't have to to overload as much. So something like doing a sit to stand, like a lot of patients will will do a sit to stand pushing through the heel. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I'll go, right, instead of pushing through the heel this time, so I'll get them to do a sit to stand, I'll say, right, where do you feel that working? Okay, I feel it through my, my heel and my toes. Right, now what I want you to do is push through the midfoot where your laces are, squash and orange. Then they'll do a sit to stand. That'll distribute the load through the gastro, the hamstring, and the, the glute, and then it'll, mm -hmm. it'll take, take load off the knee. So I think those quick wins are powerful, are important, and then that just gives you a little bit of time in the week then to go, again, set expectations, go, look, this may come back a little bit, but this is what I want you to do for the week. Then give them some you know, stretches or whatever for the quad to desensitize those, and then let's get after the, the hamstring and gastro doing, doing a bit more. So... Um, because it's very compound movements and, and, and subtle shifts of, of pressures in the foot and stuff like that, we can, we can change a, a pain experience quite quickly. And I'm a big believer in, um, in the role of the diaphragm, the pelvic floor and breathing as well. So we'd integrate a lot of breathing work into, um, into our movements, our musculoskeletal mm -hmm. movements, which is brilliant for, for decreasing pain as well, you know, because you, you get someone present. Right. So it's, it's more about, it's still about connecting with people, hearing their story, giving them hope and changing their pain experience through different movements in our kind of our skill, like our skilled decision-making rather than just me touching them to do that. Right. It, it, exactly. And, and I, you know, I, I put a, a post out the, the other day and I've kind of, I've got eight pillars um, and it's like, right. Subjective, objective, explanation, communication, slash um, 
uh, hands-on treatment, low-level rehab, high-level rehab, strength and conditioning. And like all those eight pillars, you know, I think there's something powerful that we as therapists give our patients mm -hmm. throughout the session. And I think a lot of therapists have the belief it's just this one pillar of hands-on treatment that, that makes the difference. Whereas, as I said, you know, it's the reassurance, the communication, that little bit of just getting a moving change in the way they're moving. You know, that, that all adds a lot of value to patients. And, and I think, you know, therapists need to be careful about, you know, discounting their sessions too much. Yeah. Um, because they, they have a belief that actually, you know, what I'm delivering isn't as good because I, I can't use my hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, yeah, I've heard that a ton. It's like, hey, <laughs> over the last week, it's like, oh, should I charge the same? How do I charge, you know, like, how do I not discount because, um, because I'm not touching people because it's telehealth. Can you talk more about why we shouldn't be doing that and why we are still valuable, even if I can't actually touch you? Yeah, it, it just goes back to value. And, you know, I think what, what people really want, you know, deep down is reassurance and they want to know that they're going to be OK. Um, and as I said, I think we deliver a lot of that even without, you know, what, you know, and, and, you know, I don't want to get into research and stuff, but even what we do with our hands, like the research, it's all up in the air anyway. We don't really know why, why it works. Mm -hmm. um, so all, all we do know is that it, that it works. So I think a lot of, of what we do, I think, you know, the reassurance to the patient just going, look, you're going to be okay. Do these exercises and, you know, it, it's going to help you a little bit. And, and I think a lot of patients, they need a leader, they need an authoritative figure, and they, they need to be guided. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and we can always say, you know, we're not the hero, we're the guide. We, we guide the patient, and, you know, that, that's what they're looking for. So, for me, I think we, you know, you, you trained to be a therapist, and, and the beauty of this is, I think, for therapists to have that multimodal approach, you know, you should be fine in this. I think it's the therapist that's that's very hands-on is, is the therapist, obviously, that, you know, when you come out of this, we probably need to have a look and go, actually, you know, um, you know what, what do I need to do to kind of balance those, those columns out a little bit? So, right. um, and, and look, even if, if it is a therapist doing, um, you know, that does predominantly hands-on, there's still a lot we can look at with movement, you know, touch your toes back with bend, you know, these simple movements, and, and just even talking patients through rehab and stretches, like, you know, patients pay PTs, or well, we call them PTs, like uh, personal trainers. Mm -hmm. PTs are physios in, in the US. But um, personal trainers have a lot of money just to stand there and, and watch them do exercises. So, you know, and, and I know there's more to it than that. But, um, you know, so, so why aren't we valuing ourselves um, just to, to coach a patient through rehab exercises? Um, you know, so again, yeah, I don't want to be disrespectful to, to personal trainers by, by just saying that, but you, hopefully you get my, my point. Yeah, well, I do. I mean, 100%. And to me, like, I, I tell them, like, I know I'm not being disrespectful. And yet, as physios, we've given up um, a big segment of the population and they're going to personal trainers anyways. And the personal trainers like, well, I can try these things. There's this big gap, but we kind of ignore as physios. I feel like we've allowed that to happen where we should be yeah. in control of yeah care, right and and that's that's a really interesting thing and, and i said this to my mentorship group um, last week is there's something pivotal going to happen in the market message in six weeks time and that is physiotherapy and physical therapy it's going to be by some it's going to be seen as a luxury again mm -hmm. what's not going to be seen as a luxury is strengthening your immune system and, and really get your your immune system up and you know if you think of what we do as physical therapists we get people active we, we strengthen their their, their legs and we make them healthy um so we're doing the same thing but the market of message i think is going to change and i think if we don't adapt to that i think personal trainers are, are just going to go right well let's get you fit and healthy whereas why, why can't we do that as, as, um, as therapists? And I think that immune system, you know, immunization or whatever you want to call it, I, I think it's going to be um, critical in the next kind of six to six to eight weeks. We're, we're doing a better breeding um, kind of challenge inside our patient Facebook group at the moment and, and stuff like that. So I, I think, you know, as I said, I think you guys are probably just starting to, to come into, you know, closing down and stuff like that. Now, but I think that's going to be so important um, in the next few weeks. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned uh, before the show that you've got a, uh, a program coming up uh, for people to what, learn how to do telehealth visits or the treatment um, techniques that you're using through telehealth. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, so so obviously I've got my full mentorship program, which we, we kind of open the doors twice a, twice a year for that. So obviously when, when this happened, um, a lot of therapists were kind of saying to us, well, you know, I, I don't feel confident enough to, to do this without my hands. So what I've done is I've kind of splintered off um, a section of my mentorship and um, made it very specific to telehealth where I've just taken out the the assessments that you can do, the, the rehab exercises that you can do that can give faster relief and, and stuff like that. And mm. I've just structured it in a way so that therapists can become confident in upper limb, lower limb, spine, cervical, and um, and take a patient through um, through a session from you know the, that initial assessment right through to you know the higher level rehab, even doing all the exercises in their house. So, so put together that program, um, as I said, and um, instead of kind of doing it as a full mentorship, we're, we're doing a 30 day sprint really essentially. So the therapists come in and they work with myself and the team and, and really get their confidence uh, levels, um, not only to, to perform these um, sessions, but to get results with patients, working hard and keeping them on. We, we actually saw the package of, of 10 sessions, um, one of my therapists here in the clinic, uh, True Telehealth last week. Mm -hmm. You know, so so it can be done, and, and a lot of times you just need to see someone else doing it, and you kind of go, actually, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Right. Um, so we're, we're supporting a lot of people in the community side of it that way as well, and um, and then you know just helping them with with kind of um, you know keeping retention of patients and, and really focusing on their past patients, you know, the, the low hanging fruit and, and getting them back in as well. Uh, that, that's kind of a big part of it as well. Awesome, awesome. Uh, the link for that, if someone wants to check it out, is that the the go to physio.com forward slash telehealth link. Is that yeah, that telehealth? Okay. Yeah. So by the by the I'll I'll leave that page um there. So by the time um your probably lis listeners get to that, it'll probably be um the the page might say that it's closed. But if they put in your coupon code, then okay. we'll we'll obviously get them get them into the program. Okay. Uh, which I think is cash one hundred. Yeah. I think yeah. we we put it at. So obviously that, that'll get uh, your listeners um, $100 off it um, as well. And then they, they can come in um, and, and start um, a little bit later if the, the timer is up by the time they, they get in. That's okay. no problem. Awesome. And then if you happen to be listening to this in two years, uh, I'm pretty sure they can just go to the go to physio.com and probably find some of your other current resources, et cetera. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And if they're interested, I'll probably just send us a message and I mentioned that they, um, you know, they, they heard us on, on the podcast. We will get them in um, to, to whatever program we're doing. No problem. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. I'll just repeat that. It's called the go to physio with P H Y S I O.com forward slash telehealth. And then use the code cash 100 and uh, Dave will uh, get you the telehealth course if you're um, interested in it. Um, Dave, uh, thank you so much for that. What, uh, what question didn't I ask you that you think would be helpful for our listeners? Um, I, I think we talk, we talk some, some pretty good stuff there. Um, yeah, I think, I think after mentoring maybe 350 therapists, what's, what's the one thing that I think is the, the low hanging fruit that, yeah. that can make a big difference to therapist confidence. And I think it's, it's really working hard on on structuring um, your 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 flow almost from the subjective to the objective, to the hands on to the rehab to the high end rehab and and see where that fits. And I, I think if you can work a little bit on that rather than worrying too much about okay I need to learn more hands on techniques or I need to learn more rehab, but actually the flow of it, I think you get tremendous confidence as a therapist, which. I think mean, don't underestimate how that transfers through to the patient in terms of your authority and you know your your self belief, which you know without being cocky or anything. But I think that's very important for a patient then to say, right, this person knows what you're talking about, which gives them a lot of confidence to to get a result. So I'm a big fan of authority and, and belief, you know, as a therapist and, and taking a leadership role. And for me, all of that seems to start with with the therapist having clarity on on that structured system. So. Um, that's probably my biggest advice to, to therapists is, is really work hard, whether it's with myself or whether, you know, you, you have something yourself, but you just need to refine it more is, is really think about that structure rather than just adding another tool to the, to the system really. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that's been, that's been a lifesaver for me. Yeah. So is it, it's how to get people from one stage to the next seamlessly and getting the buy-in getting the treatment getting here's what all the next steps are right? exactly and and i think what you'll find there then is you're going to use a lot less hands-on you're going to use a lot less rehab exercises because the exercise is designed to get the person from one step to the next step as opposed to 
feeling like you need a hundred different exercises because you're, you're getting bored and you'll just streamline your, your progressions and, you know, never get sick of doing the basics really well. Um, and I think a lot of my exercises, we just keep it very simple. It's, it's that little shift from the heel to the midfoot that just gets other things firing and it, you know, it makes all the difference, um, to, to the patient really. Wow. That's awesome, Dave. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate you being here and, uh, yeah, no, hey, thanks for having me on. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. But yeah. Awesome. If someone wants to ch um, check you out on social media, where do they find you? Yeah, um, it's, uh, I think it's Dave O'Sullivan's Pro Sport Academy. Mm -hmm. So if you Google that on Facebook or Instagram, you'll, you'll pick us up. And I'm sorry, I don't know the, the links. I'm on Twitter as well, um, but I'm, I'm not that active. Not yet. At Davey O'Sullivan, I think it's called. Sorry. Yeah. I'm a bad yeah. businessman. Um, but it's, it's something, <laughs> something like that. Dave O'Sullivan's Pro Sport Academy or the go to physio.com. Yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll pick us up on that okay. as well. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Dave. I really appreciate it. Um, keep rocking and rolling over there. And uh, we'll be looking to you guys for what's coming in the next few weeks. So Yeah, I hope, I hope you all stay, 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 stay safe. As I said, you know, take that day to, to kind of, you know, dust yourselves down, but, you know, take action. And um, as I said, it's, um, you know, there's a big opportunity to get a lot of stuff right. So I, I hope you, uh, you stay safe and, um, and you all come out the other end of it as well. Yeah. And, and us too. <laughs> I know. Well, thank you very much, all. This is the Cash PT Lunch Hour uh, with Aaron LeBauer and Dave O'Sullivan. Stay safe, take action because there's an end in sight. And if you're still running and doing everything, you'll be on top. So we'll see you guys on the next show.